Welcome to Every Step Podcast. I'm Christina Weston. And I'm Judith Beck. Every Step is the podcast where career and life meet. With a new guest every episode, we explore the gutsy issues affecting everyone in the workplace. Today, we are joined by Chelsea Pottinger, international wellbeing speaker, ambassador for mental health charities, and author of The Mindful High Performer. Chelsea's passion is helping busy minds reset, recharge, and navigate the challenges of everyday life. Our conversation explores mental health and resilience. Chelsea, it's so great to have you with us today. Um, Today we're talking about mental health and resilience. And I know from my own personal journey, I've had to really learn how to exercise my resilience muscles. Uh, I thought I was resilient being a serial entrepreneur and starting out, but I think startups test you like nothing else. I know you've been on the same on the same journey. How has as being in your own startup, how have you had to test your own resilience skills and you build your own resilience muscles? Look, that's a that's a fantastic question. And I think, you know, with any startup or any founder or any entrepreneur, they at the start, it's a hard slog and you have to have this unwavering obsession about what you're building and your vision, because at the very beginning, you're wearing every hat, right? Like you're the CEO, you're HR, you're doing the invoicing, you're booking your flights, you you know, and you, so you're doing it all. And you also are faced with a lot of rejection. And so that's a huge thing a part of being a resilient human being is that. So true. Right? You get a lot of knockbacks at the start and you're the one. No has to become your friend as opposed to your enemy, the word no. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And I always feel like, you know, the no is just a no at the moment. It's not a no forever. And so taking that away from it being a personal hit against EQ Minds or against me personally, that's helped me, you know, just muster up enough of the, the grittiness that I need to, you know, to stay really on course for the company and stay very determined, you know? Uh, so I think that's a huge thing because, I mean, people just see companies 10 years down the track and they're like, they're so lucky. That just happened. For- it's not that. <laughs> yeah. I know even talking to fellow entrepreneurs and you see their LinkedIn profiles and and I caught up with one at, a, at a, an industry event the other week and I said, oh, you seem to be doing so well and congratulations. He said, yeah, we're just... We have, we have to pump it up for the media, right? And mm. then he shared with me his personal story. And it was vastly different from what was being shared on, on social media. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the challenge is, is to hold, hold yourself together through, and whether you're in a startup or whether you're in corporate land, it's, you know, it's the same, same stuff but different. Um, holding yourself together, and, but staying authentic as well, being real. Because it's, gee, it's hard hold, keeping that mask up. So hard. It's so hard, and it's also exhausting, and and you kind of don't want to be friends with people like that. I that's how I feel anyway. I think the perfectionism has to go, and you know, for us, one of our one of our brand value pillars is authenticity and vulnerability. And I'm very very honest about my mental health, about the realities of startup world, about everything from even sleeping in a separate room to my husband. You know, like I just feel like. It sets people up for failure, you know, Mm -hmm. when they don't realise what goes on behind the scenes. And I don't want that, particularly for other women as well who are in business. Uh, I'm trying to break those walls down of like, let's put each other up on each other's shoulders and, you know, um, propel the future generation forward rather than chip each other down. So I think that authenticity and vulnerability is a huge component. And I also feel like that's what consumers are looking for these days too. They want to... Connection. Yeah, isn't it? It's all about yeah. the connection piece. It Absolutely. is. It is. I think, look, I think starting a new business, um, going in with the, the view of one, this first year, it is going to be hard. <laughs> and I'm going to have to work harder than I ever have before. But if you're passionate about it, then you turn your fear into passion and you think I'm doing this for a reason because I love it Mm -hmm. and it is going to be hard and but I have to um, 
I have to identify, I have to be realistic about it as well. And you have to have a good support group behind you as, as well. And, and your, yeah, your family key. support needs to be there. All those things happen because there's a lot of times in that first year, in the first five years that that you would be going, is this worth it? Do I really want to do this again? Financially, mentally, everything. And if you don't have that inner sort of voice saying to you, why not? <laughs> yeah, you can do this. Yeah. Um, I think that's very important. It's it's important to have that inner cheerleader, but also people around you who are cheering you on to keep going. If you're passionate about it, eventually you will get there. I agree with you, Judith. I think I believe it can be a very, very, having been through it myself and spoken to other um, startup founders, it can be a very lonely journey. And actually having somebody who's walked in your shoes and I, I know I was chatting to, to, to somebody who started up, some, had the first startup three years ago, and I was coaching her beforehand. And I don't think she heard what I was telling her. When I was trying to explain to her the challenges, I think it was, all, it was almost like blah, 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 blah. You know, it was like, and then and then when I caught up with her six or 12 months in, she went, I, I didn't hear you. I really didn't. I didn't hear, I didn't realize it was, was going to be this hard. And it was all about that resilience piece. And so what's the essence of that in, in all the work you do, Chelsea? What, how do you build those resilience? Mind? What are the practical things that we have to do? Because we can hear it and it kind of bounces off as, oh, yeah, I, I can handle that. I'm tough. I can handle anything. I've been through tough things. But some things you just have never been through. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And I really feel like, you know, resilience is such a skill and we can definitely strengthen it. It's, it's the resilience and the ability to not only cope with adversity and challenge and setback and failures within your company, but thrive because of it. And I always think, you know, with resilience, just as some people are born with maybe potentially more athletic ability than others, some people are born with more innate resilience. But the cool part of this whole sort of conversation is that you can build it. You can build the resilience. You can build the strength that we need in the same way, right, that we train to get more muscle and coordination to kind of run faster or jump higher. All it takes is consistent exercise. And so while well, some of the exercises that people do to strengthen up the muscles of the brain or of the body is physical, you know, like going for a walk or practicing yoga or something like that, the majority of them are, are cognitive when it comes to, to resilience. And, and the best news is like, rather than like flogging yourself on the pavement for 10 kilometers, uh, you know, it's actually just taking 10 minutes a day to hone in on skills of, you know, cognitive training, like gratitude practice or reflective journaling or meditation for 10 minutes a day to make these really healthy changes in the brain. So I think, I don't know what you think, both of you, but I feel like we've got this problem at the moment, shielding our youth, well, you know, like our future generation from challenges, from facing adversity. Oh, cotton wooling, co yeah. cotton wooling. Helicopter down. Cotton. <gasps> so bizarre to me. Because everybody gets a medal. Everybody gets an award. They do. Where do and we I learn to fail? Where do we learn to fail? Where do we learn that we're not those, that's not what we're good at and then channeling our energy into what we are good at? Well, well, you know, if you think think about it with everyone gets a ribbon, Christina, is that if, if kids are, are growing up that way, then they get into the work environment and someone tells them no, or they're trying to start a business and they get a knockback. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, what's, where's my ribbon? <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to give me the business? They don't know how to react and they're not going to. We need to let them fall down. Self-regulate. Where's that self-regulation? Mm hmm. And I'm sure, well, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but, you know, reflecting back on I've had a lot of failure and challenges and rejection and change in my life. But reflecting back on that, those those hard times, that's where we grow. And that's actually makes us. the um, people we are today. Absolutely. I, I we call them learnings. My husband and I, we're in business together, a bit like you and your husband are in business yeah. together. We call them learnings and um, learning from failure. And we wear them as a badge of honor. I love that. We've learned yeah. so much. And I, part of it is, you know, we talk about mindset. Part of it is mindset. And part of it is around always being curious and always looking to learn and always looking to improve, which means not getting it right is part of that. 
it's an intrinsic part of that. And if I'm getting it right all the time, then I'm either deluding myself or something's wrong. Do you know what I mean? It's almost about embracing that. Um, I'm not going to get it right all the time and I need to actually reach out to others that can support me so I can get it right more often. But I don't want to get it 100% right the whole time, if that sounds bizarre. It sounds backwards. but No, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. How's it? Can we quickly go there in terms of what yeah. it's like being with your husband? <laughs> I, oh, um, really challenging, I have to say. And um, we've we've shared this publicly before, so he won't mind me talking about this. We're very, very different under stress. Mm -hmm. I'm an extrovert under stress and he's an introvert under stress. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about it and he wants to go into his man cave. <laughs> and, and then I'm screaming because you're not listening to me. And he's, he's going, well, this, I mean, he's not even articulating that this is the way he's coping, but I've learned this is now the way he copes. Mm -hmm. And being in a startup when you're under financial pressure, mm -hmm. it puts relationships enormously under pressure and forget that it's husband and wife even if you're best friends in business mm -hmm. when there's financial pressure it takes relationships and your communication ability or lack thereof to a whole new level and if you're not self-aware that and I'm still guilty of it the tendency is to just vomit at your partner because you're frustrated at something else that's going on and you take it out on the person that you love the most it is exceptionally challenging working with your husband. Really challenging. <laughs> Are you, is, is there any resonance with your experience or is it just me? <laughs> Look, I love your honesty. I love it. I love your authenticity. I feel like, you know, Jay didn't step into our company for three years. Uh, and because I had this pretty hard rule around not working with very, very close friends and, but I needed a really good GM. And so I needed someone who I could trust and had a really, you know, high work ethic and really committed. And so when he joined the company, we saw our psychologist, we see a therapist, you know, once or twice a year, just to make sure things are humming along nicely. And so she helped us really define our roles in the company. So we had different set rules and, and roles within the organization. And that, that was very, very helpful. Also, we work in different spaces. You know, Jay slurps his soup too loud. I slurp my tea too loud. It just, it just annoys, right? <laughs> um, but to be honest, you know, having in, him in the company has been magnificent in terms of taking us into the next sphere. And the commitment, I think, if you're going into a business relationship with a partner, it's really important to, because you're going to have some really difficult things, as you're mentioning in business, and you need someone who is really committed and capable of doing really hard things and they're hardcore because no matter what happens, you're going to have to get through it together. Absolutely. And you have to trust each other. I think, and that's yeah. what my husband and I have. We apps, you know, we might have our disagreements, but we respect each other and mm. we trust each other. And you I think probably we also yeah. need to have sort of an agreement of if there's an impasse. So who makes the final decision in this case, kind of like the, um, you know, the Sheldon work uh, uh, roommate agreement. On <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Who makes that final decision if, because you, if you get to, if you get to a point where you both are passionate about it and you want to go one way because one person is more marketing focused and the other person is more financially focused, this is going to cost us money, but wait, you got to spend money to make money. <laughs> Where who makes the final decision? I think setting that rules of engagement is probably even if it's a flip of the coin. <laughs> and they'll trigger different people differently. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about resilience and and mindset and and mental health, and we're all at different places at different times. One of us might be more up, and the other one's feeling more triggered. I get very triggered by lack of money. Um, mm -hmm. lack of cash flow my husband isn't triggered in the same way in business as I am so you know we're all at different places with our um, feelings of resilience depending on how we've been triggered and what our what our triggers are and and, and understanding what that is so you can have some self-reflection and own your own stuff rather than projecting all your vomit <laughs> all over you know your business partner or your you know your life partner 
Yeah, that's that's so true. And I feel like, you know, sometimes founders have success buyers where they feel like whatever they do is going to be successful. And it's just not true. I think one of the big things is that one of our other core values is this humility, you know, it's this commitment, it's the intensity, but then it's that humility around that, you know, we want people to be in this company with high intensity and, and the intelligence, but they also need to have the humility that to recognize that they might ha not have all the answers and that absolutely mm -hmm. includes me. So I, uh, I show a lot of appreciation um, within the team. And to be honest, my team of five, the internal team, um, they tend to come up with better answers for EQ minds and they will say, hey, this is a team decision. It's not, well, this is what I came up with. And, you know, th it's really dropping that ego side of it. But as you're mentioning there around sometimes people will be in different head spaces if their mental health isn't thriving or if they're, you know, you need to be able to lean on those trusted advisors within your company to, to pitch in and make the yeah. more rational decision uh, if you are actually feeling overburdened or, you know, very, very exhausted at, at that period yeah. of time. Yeah, and that's yeah, really challenging. Founders probably do as well is that when you first start the business, you feel the you feel compelled to try to do everything yourself. Mm. And when you do that, that means you're not giving other team members the ability to learn and, and be challenged. And I think it's really important um, that people who are starting business remembered you, you can have it all, you just can't do it all. And let your people make mistakes. If if that if that happens, it happens. But we're so like, oh, I can't make a mistake. I you know, this is my first big client, I've got to make sure it's all right, you know, and um, that can, that can prevent you from growing as yeah. well, because you're not then taking on more, you're just doing too much. And um, I, I found, you know, like, this, I had FRG for, for 25 years, but in those first five years, the, the competition, the other thing is, is you get stressed out because you're too worried about what the competition are doing. And you really just got to say, I don't care what the competition they're doing. I know what they're doing. I've done my research. That's it. I don't care what they're doing. I'm just going to focus on my offering and I'm going to, I'm going to um, not get stressed out about all those little things that really don't matter. It's just what matters in my business. And, um, and then having that downtime on the weekend, cutting off, mm -hmm. you know, cutting off, you know, cutting off that time, making time for your family and yourself. I think that's really important because otherwise you will burn out in the first three years. Well, there's stats on it, isn't it? About mm -hmm. the success of companies, first year, third year, fifth year, and then it goes on. And there's a reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of feels like there's a bigger strategic kind of issue or a, a, a mindset or a change underway in terms of leaders have always been positioned to have all the answers, to be all-knowing, all-wise, uh, to never be vulnerable, to never show emotion, to never show their humanity. It's kind of old school leadership. And we're in this really interesting transition period at the moment where, uh, and we're seeing it in sport, which is amazing too, but, you know, from very male dominated environments where there's there's more of an embracing, it's still early days, we're not, we're nowhere near there yet, around that being vulnerable, not having all the answers, having had a go and got it wrong and saying, well, I, I made that call, but it was wrong. And not actually being crushed under the weight of that. But there's a lot of emotional transitioning and self-reflection that needs to happen to achieve all of that. So it's it's challenging. How do we take people on that that journey from old style leadership, I'm invincible, I'm superwoman, I'm superman, to, hey, I'm fallible and that's okay and that makes me an amazing leader. I think it always starts from the top, you know, in the executive leadership themes and I feel like there's definitely been a movement, you know, over the last six years of seeing what's happening at EQ Minds with the companies that we train from, you know, the globe's biggest brands is that, the more authentic and vulnerable the leaders are and they're kind of paving the way in terms of really honoring their sleep or if they say hey we're going to invest in a well-being program they're turning up to all the sessions and they're no longer peppering their staff at 1am with work emails and they're kind of really living and breathing it and the future generation they don't want to be flogged for 80 hours a week 
they actually want to choose organizations that generally care about them they care about the environment they've got inclusivity and diversity and so they're demanding different things from their from their sort of leaders and so i feel like there's more leaders now at the top who are genuine who do have that they're okay with sharing that uh, and it's making for a more connected culture within those organizations and it's really interesting because once you've been in corporate which we've all been right for a decade and and you know when i was in corporate we used to like you know honor the ceo that would turn up at 2 a.m on an international flight and be at the office at 6 a.m and almost like this machismo of like oh my god absolutely yeah and that that is now gone you know because yeah. we know how bad that is for their productivity their sleep their memory consolidation and so they're actually lower performing the next day if they're not sleeping yeah. well. well we were and valuing then, input not output so we've got to change our values absolutely and how beautiful is it that we're seeing this and how beautiful is it that we all have our companies that we can you know foster these kinds of cultures ourselves of like you know really encouraging people to take proper breaks and take some tech free time and to have a well-being budget where they have a massage every week if they want to and uh because as we know it time falls off a cliff right particularly as we age and so we want people to be having a good time and feeling really fulfilled and having their mental health thriving and to dance off this planet at 105 with really good health span going well that was fun and you know that key mm -hmm. that I think the key is, is that especially when you look at these large companies, right, that if it doesn't flow from the top, because I know companies who give their employees an extra thousand dollars a month for their for their gym membership or and then what would happen at the end of the year, they didn't spend it. And so I go, why didn't you spend it? And it didn't hard roll KPI, over. hard KPI. <laughs> it didn't roll over, right? It didn't, the thousand dollars didn't roll over. If they didn't use it, they lost it. So they didn't spend it because they weren't seeing the role models mm -hmm. taking it and their team leaders or managers weren't. So even though the company was going, yeah, we want you to do this you know, that the behaviors weren't matching the words. And so they weren't actually, you know, it was wasted, which is a shame because you think someone offered me a thousand dollars for, I'd be taking it. <laughs> and it didn't have to be a gym membership. It could be, you know, like something to do, any, anything to do with their well being. It could have been any, they could have used it for, you know, therapy if they wanted to, anything, but they didn't use it. And I was so surprised all the time um that that wasn't be and you hear about this all the time or empty gyms within companies where no one no one's going in there or um and again if the leaders don't show that they're doing it the other ones won't and it's a continual it's not just a one-off is it because new people are coming into the business all the time so it's got to be continual and showing uh being a good example Absolutely. It's like parenting, you know, like if you're telling your child, get off your phone, get off your phone. And then when you're at a cafe talking to your friends and you're on your phone, that is such a dissonance, you know, and they're like, well, mom, you, you're always on your phone mm -hmm. or you tell me to go and exercise, but you're here in the morning, you know, eating Maccas, watching TV for 10 hours, but you're really pro -ex I mean, there's just, <laughs> the kids will absorb what you are doing. And that's why even as parents, we've got to be really good role models for the future generation generation too because they are always watching us so when it comes to resilience if we're like if we just give up on something and, and just toss it in because we're not good at it they learn those behaviors rather than going well hang on I'm not good at this yet however if I keep doing these things keep turning up to surf coach training and keep you know practicing I'll get there and they watch that and then they mirror that behavior. Yeah. So, and that's, that's a key. I love that expression. You know, I'm not, there's the power of the word yet. Mm. I'm not, I'm not there yet, or I'm not as good as so-and-so yet. I mean, no concert pianist, no amazing tennis player, no, no amazing athlete stopped after two practices. That's so true. That's so true. And it's such a simple mindset shift, isn't it? It's that simple little reframe, just sort of forming up that limiting belief or that fixed belief. You know, if anyone's listening at the moment and they do have a limiting belief, like I can't launch a business or I can't public speak or I can't take care of my finances. 
if you say yet at the end, you know, I can't public speak yet. However, and then you just put up a few little micro goals, like action up against that life lesson. However, if I join Toastmasters or if I practice more regularly or if I have more fun with it, what happens? I will become a public speaker. So it's these, and I constantly use that as I get older. I can't ride a horse yet. However, if I turn up to lessons every Sunday with our daughter and I get on text and I learn the basics, you know, a year and a half later, I'm now riding a horse beautifully. And so I always am in that learner mindset of throwing myself in these situations where I'm crap, absolutely crap at things. And then I just learn it along the way. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly it's application, right. isn't it? I mean, part of it's application and a big part of it's mindset, believing that if you want to do it, you can do it. It's all up to you. That's well, right. You know, it's funny. I used to hear candidates saying uh, when I was doing interviewing people and they'd say, oh, they're just so fantastic. They're just, you know, I could never get to that level. I just can't get to that. I go, well, they just got there first. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> like, they're, just, they're no different. You know how you have people who were so in awe about celebrities and things mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and I, you know, I just go, well, they're just good singers they're good at singing and that person is good at memorizing lines and putting emotion into it that mm -hmm. doesn't make them better than you it just makes them good at what they do i and love that don't put them on a pedestal you you know don't um i've got this thing about not levelizing putting people on and i think that's a really probably good tip for people who yeah. are starting businesses don't comparing level ourselves because and comparing because they're not better than you they're just in a different role or in they're in a different position or a different stage of their life and treat every single person exactly the same. And that will help you in your business because some people will treat people one way and then they might not treat that receptionist so, so nicely when they go into the office. And that's a big mistake yeah. <laughs> or the PA or, you know, just treat them all nicely and you'll probably um, build some good contacts and some good um, resources. I love that, Judith. I think that's yeah, absolutely spot on. You know, I think comparing yourself to others, I think social media plays a huge role in that and it massively impacts our mental health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're constantly in this comparison mode, it's a very quick way to experience unhappiness. And as you're mentioning, you know, there's going to be someone who's a better singer than us. There's always going to be someone who's better looking than us. There's going to be someone with more money than us. There's going to be someone with a nicer house, whatever it is. And I think you just have to let that go, swim in your own lane. And I really think when we appreciate our own journey rather than the destination, it helps dramatically. Like I'm such Very a satisfier. True. You know, when I was in my one bedroom unit in Sydney, I was so happy. When I used to ride, you know, drive my Hyundai XL that, you know, it had no air conditioning and I have to wear a bikini, you know, <laughs> home to Aubrey. And I thought, gosh, <laughs> someone blows on this car it's going to blow up into flames um, <laughs> but i love that car i defended it with all my heart <laughs> and it's, i've always been really happy in the moment and appreciating just being really grateful of what you truly have and then it doesn't matter right if say for example you experience in business a bit of a lull where things kind of get taken away the home the house the as long as they don't take your health and as long as they don't take the family you're going to be okay. Absolutely. You know, this it's other a really, stuff, yeah. It's a really it's important good. reframe. Uh, society has really set us up to de define success as financial. So you've got the multi-million dollar oceanfront house. You've got the, the two fancy dancy $300,000 four wheel drives parked out the front and that's what success looks like. But we've, you're so right. We forget about what's, there are multiple areas of success and we need to stop judging ourselves on just one factor, but look at, you know, our health, the quality of our friendships, um, how content we are, the fact that we're blessed to be able to walk out into beautiful nature and, and hey, isn't it gorgeous that the bird just flew by and there's a butterfly dancing around. Yeah. And reframe, reframe it, but we're so caught up in this, but everything has to be, everything's judged based on either your position in society, who you know, who you hang out with, and mostly how much money you have. Yeah, absolutely. But that's a point about being content. And I think that that is something um, when you're starting a new business as well, and even getting into your five-year um, period uh, that 
when you're doing something, you're content and it's working well. Other t- other people and, and other uh, influencers will go, but why don't you add this onto your portfolio? Why don't you why don't you do this and add this? But I don't want to do this. I I because I, I can remember even when I was doing executive search, people would say, if you had a contract division, you that you know that would be so profitable and so good. And why don't you do general recruitment? I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> because one, one high risk, more time. I'm happy just doing the executive search and I'm just going to continue that way. You have to be able to go, what is good for you as a business owner and not try to take on things that you really don't want to be you're really not passionate about that can actually bring your business down. Because mm. I've seen that over the years too, when people have taken on something else. Do what you love. Do what you love. Is what took their business down. And, you know, contracting, I've seen that too over the years where contracting business, because if the economy changes, that closes day one, almost contractors are no longer. So with any business, if you take on something that you really got feeling says, don't take it on, don't do it, because that will impact on your stress levels and your time and you're doing something that you're really not wanting to do and you're taking focus off your core. I think that's incredible. what made you successful. That's very profound. And I think sometimes you get very, uh, I, I know it happens to me still all the time. I get, you know, distracted sometimes with the shiny things that come my way every day. And and I've got two phenomenal mentors that keep me very aligned to the business strategy. And if I ever try and shove a square peg into a round hole, they're like, <laughs> that's not a part of your strategy for the next three years. Let's stay to the true course of where you're going. And it's so true because then you have energy and you're and it's always we always whenever something comes to us my husband's fantastic at this it's like is it on the company mission of empowering and educating people to take care of their mental health if it's not it's a hard no so that's a really good for us like you know this barometer in a sense okay that's that, that's a pulse check right is this aligned no it's not it's a hard no and then is it does it take our energy away from the three-year strategy uh, and if it does, then it's a no. <laughs> and we've had to get really good at that. Yeah. I'm a very excitable person. I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can relate to that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, ladies, we could talk about this for hours. This is <laughs> such a good subject, but unfortunately, we don't have hours. So I'm going to ask you one quick question. And if everybody could give me a one minute answer. So if you were advising a young person today, or anyone really for that matter, who wanted to start a new business, what would you tell them about how to handle their mental health and how to be resilient resilient to those early setbacks? Chelsea. Okay, so how to handle resilience in your mental health. Obviously, I'm very big on mental health, being someone who's very vulnerable to mental illness myself. So I really feel like how you feel on a daily basis with your mental health is going to greatly impact your judgments about your resilience. For example, if you're feeling positive about a situation and healthy in your daily life, your chances of reacting in a constructive manner, right, to setbacks within your company will be much higher uh, than when you're feeling depressed or anxious or exhausted. You know, you may have heard the saying, you know, uh, you know, that whole, they're saying they're sick and tired of feeling (laughs) sick and tired, right? It's, it's, (laughs) really hard to find the energy you need to be resilient in your company in your startup or in any situation if you're feeling under the weather or flat and so for new people who are starting their business you have to sustain that balanced life of eating well exercising sleeping well it could be meditating or expressing gratitude whatever kind of stress management tool is there and then taking scheduled breaks so for example at eq minds I encourage all of our staff, all of our teams and our people, as well as our new speakers to take a break every six weeks and, you know, work 40 weeks a year. They still get paid exceptionally well, but take scheduled breaks. So you're here for longevity and the long term. And then that way their stress levels aren't sort of hijacking their potential to succeed. So I am huge on honoring your mental health for your resilience. And if you get a setback or a knockback, just remember, That's where your best learnings are going to come from. That is where the grit lies. So if you find yourself in a trench, just remind yourself, hey, this is where I'm going to grow. (laughs) I'll reflect back on this going. But that was actually a learning curve. So true. So true. For me, it's very, for me, it's similar. It's, it's, um, 
and in my own personal journey, what's helped my resilience is embracing the flurnings. I used that word earlier on. Um, love and hug, love and hug your failures. Look at them as a gift and say, well, wow, at least we've learned, we, we didn't get this outcome, but we've learned this. And because we've learned this, we're not going to make th those decisions again. And just reframe it, reframe it as a positive, reframe it as a gift. And that's that that gets caught up a little bit in what you're talking about in terms of gratitude. It's like, hey, I'm really grateful that I had that experience because life is all about learning. And when we stop learning, we might as well be, you know, six foot under. So embrace the learning, embrace the failure. I know it's a mind shift. It's a massive mind shift, but that's what's worked for me personally. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing is, is that in those first, in those first, you know, one to three years, you're going to be seeing that many clients and there's going to be a lot of them that are going to say, no, thank you, but thanks for coming. And maybe we will in the future. And I think the most important thing is if you dwell on that as a failure and think, oh, you know, we're not good enough, whatever, you just got to go, first, you got to find out the why, why aren't you going to use our services? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't ask clients why, and you can get a lot of powerful information about finding out, well, was it? you know, the product, the price, whatever, find out the why, don't be afraid to ask, and then um, improve it, improve it for the next time, whatever you have to do, but don't waste your time not finding out why you didn't succeed in a tender or a sale or whatever, find out why, because it's a learning experience, and don't dwell on it, because dwelling you'll be internalizing and you're stressed and you're thinking, oh, you know, all this stuff. No, get it over, be quick. Fast no is a good no and why. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Chelsea, my goodness, we could talk all the time. This is such a good subject and there's so much more. And we really appreciate you coming on and we would love to have you back in the future. Love and your honesty. Thank you. Yeah, love oh, it. Thank love it. So thank much. you so much. I loved our chat. Thank you so, so much. I love what you both are doing as well. And honestly, I could have stayed and chatted to you all day. But well, let's have you back. We'll have you yeah, back. Thank have you, you back in the next 12 months. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. For more information about Every Step and our guests, head to everysteppodcast.com. To be notified of new podcasts, please subscribe via your favorite listening platform. And of course, follow us on social media and direct message us to share your ideas about guests or topics.